Good afternoon, friends, and yet to be friends. It's great to be here. Um, I'm very excited about this conversation. I spend lots of time thinking about Global LA, uh, and what the reason I'm thrilled to have this chance to talk to these two friends and uh, great diplomats uh, is that they are both Angelinos and outsiders, and, uh, and they're neighbors, and incredibly important neighbors of Los Angeles and of California and of the United States. Um, and so I think their perspective on who we are is going to be very enlightening. Uh, as John Rawson said in the earlier session that I um, sat in on, and something the mayor says all the time, is that it's, it's LA's moment. And the next 10 years are going to be incredibly exciting, as I think the last 10 years have been, to see how LA is changing and really coming into itself as a great global city. Um, I came across a tweet, and actually it may have been from you, Zabe, but no, 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 it wasn't from you, I'm sorry. I know who it was from. But anyway, there was a tweet uh, which was pronouncing that um, London was ranked, London was ranked second in the world's most economically dynamic cities. And I thought, oh, that's interesting. And so I you know, went to find the source, and it was LA that's ranked first. Yeah, so I was um, uh, delighted <laughs> and surprised. To, uh, to find out that we, that we um, are so, you know, that we are looked upon this way by a um, fancy investment firm in London. <laughs> uh, in any case, I have a few questions for these uh, gentlemen and then we'll turn it over to you for your great questions. Um, so to start with, um, economic and cultural and social ties are at the heart of your work. Um, can you describe a little bit your country's ties to Los Angeles and what makes Los Angeles worthy of the high caliber diplomatic uh, representation that, that you two, uh, or that we enjoy, that you two represent? Uh, thank you, uh, great to be here and, and thanks Jerry for those uh, incredible words that you shared for on behalf of all of us. Um, you really like us, you really, really like us. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks Nina. Um, so Canada uh, feels very closely connected to uh, LA County. We have over 100,000 Canadians, um, uh, give or take, living in the LA County. Um, and that may not sound like a lot to uh, the US or Mexico, but to Canada is a country of about 37 million people, so that's uh, quite a lot for us. Um, and that's a real important um, signifier, I think, of what it means. Um, when Canadians think of the US, uh, where do they want to be? Where do they think their most greatest opportunities and greatest friendships and greatest partnerships are? It's in the LA County. Um, and, there are over, um, uh, there are about nine congressional districts that are, are, are sort of, you know, uh, make up, uh, are made up of the LA County, and we've got, uh, I'm going to read some stats here, so pardon me, but uh, 265,000 jobs dependent on the US-Canada trade uh, within that. 350 Canadian-owned businesses in, in that region, and uh, about 17,000 City of LA inhabitants are employed by Canadian-owned businesses. So that's a... That's a key connector, I think, economically um, for the health of, of Canada and the LA County. And then, of course, LA is a, is a global city, uh, and in, in a North American city. And when you think of the, uh, the top uh, you know, cities in, in North America, you've got uh, Mexico City, you've got LA, and, and Toronto, where I, I come from, my hometown. Um, and so when you're a Torontonian and a Canadian, at least, LA is, and when you're in media entertainment, of course, but even just as you're a Torontonian, LA really speaks to you on a number of levels, and, and Jerry mentioned them, and we'll talk more about them, but the values that uh, Torontonians feel, um, uh, the, they feel very aligned to LA's values. Well, let me start by saying that, maybe as you some know, I'm, well, Jerry confirmed, and thank you for your words too, Jerry, I'm living sadly living in a few weeks this fantastic city. So for me, it's a, a good opportunity to say 
Thank you, Angeles, and thank you, Pacific Council. This is my third global summit, and it's an incredible event. So thank you. Uh, well, it's, it's difficult to be precise when you speak about the connections between Mexico and Los Angeles. <laughs> You all live in this city, and I'm sure you every day see a bit of Mexico. Mm. Food, architecture, history, arts, you name it. But let's say just demographics. This is the largest amount community of Mexicans living out of Mexico. We have roughly in County Los Angeles a million seven hundred Mexicans, born Mexicans. And you have in, in LA City roughly a million three hundred thousand. So that's the size of the Mexican population living here. But vice versa is something that less people know. The largest amount of Americans living out of the US live in Mexico. And many of those living in Mexico live uh, are from, from Los Angeles, are from California. So it's uh, both ways exchange speaking demographics but also tourism you have a million three hundred thousand seats per year to different destinations to mexico from lax 38 percent of the international visitors of la are mexicans by far the first country speaking about visitors even much ahead of the chinese and the Canadians that are the third visitors. So there is a very intense, complex, integral, holistic connection between Mexico and Los Angeles. And I take the opportunity, if you allow me, because Jerry and Nina have been involved in this exercise, to upgrade this very successful and important relationship to the point that we thought jointly that it was time to set up a, a forum of continuous dialogue between Mexico and Los Angeles. Mexico has just four international commissions of permanent dialogue, and all the four are with countries, Canada, Japan, France, and Spain. So we have decided jointly, Los Angeles and Mexico, to create a permanent commission of dialogue that we will be officially launching in a few weeks. But this is a proof of how intense, how important are the relationships between Mexico and Los Angeles. Um, let me ask you maybe a slightly trickier question. So. I would like to know from you know your perspective, having been here now for four years? Three years. Three years. Almost. Um, and your relatively newer perspective. Five months. Dave. Yeah. <laughs> I know LA well more than that for my pre, but yeah, in this particular incarnation. <laughs> um, I'm curious what you think Los Angeles is doing well and where we could use improvements when it comes to how we are influential on the global stage, how we project our identity, um, how our um, you know how our assets or, or liabilities come across on a from a global perspective. Well, I think I think I, you know in terms of from a Canadian standpoint, when I mentioned the, the stats about how connected we are, I think that speaks to how well how amazingly well Canadians think of, of Los Angeles. And when you think of the, when you're a kid growing up, when you're an immigrant, uh, you know, when you're a kid born in a country where immigrants have come to that country and chosen that country out of all the countries they could have chosen in the world, they choose Canada and you're born in Toronto and you hear of LA, it still, it excites you. You know, and so when you, and you talk to Canadians and they think of LA, no, no matter what business they're in, LA meet quickly, there's, a, there's something that happens. So in terms of the, the brand LA, what Angelinos have done throughout history for the last uh, hundreds of years to build that brand, it's really, it's really selling itself in Canada. Um, and that's really important. And the values, as I mentioned, inclusivity, um, uh, 
progressive looks, moderate looks at, at how the world uh, sh should be. And how and that video that we just saw, the, the researchers that are here, um, those kinds of values and that kind of science-based invention, innovation, excitement, LA really comes uh, across that way. So, you know, check mark, check mark, check mark. I think when you're, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're hoping LA can, can help the world see itself better. I think, if I think about it from a city standpoint, and I'm from a, the largest city in Canada, um, it's those ideas of what LA does for its own citizens. Mm -hmm. That sometimes in this globe, in this desire to be global, we can forget about our very own because we're so grasping, we want to hug everybody, but we forget to the hug the ones that are closest to us. And I think maybe, and we hear about those stats, and, and the mayor and you have, have mentioned those, uh, Nina, so we don't wanna sort of get too locked up in those, but you know what I'm talking about, I think, whether it's homelessness or, or, or other factors. I think we could learn, the world could learn from LA if it, if it can help that, if it can help itself, if it can help it own, its own citizens, I think we would, could learn from that. Well, I have been many times in this fantastic city since I was a very young kid. I came and again and again, so I can say that I, I'm a big fan of this place, and I, I think I know quite well Los Angeles. Uh, for me, something that is really incredible, impressive, and you all know why, is how progressive is this it? Is the world capital of innovation? It's incredible. Every time you come and see, you look a better LA, incredibly creative and innovative. Uh, you started recently, for me, is a beautiful and important program that is the Maya, the young, the major young ambassadors. You sent some young kids to Mexico, to the state of Durango, then a different group went to Egypt, then to Japan, and I salute my colleague, the Consul General from Japan, and I'm sure you will continue doing this. This is a very important uh, idea because it speaks about integration, human contacts. At the end of the day, we are speaking about human beings. Uh, since LA is a true capital of inclusion and integration, I think you should keep developing this idea and expanding this idea. I remember my late, my late friend in Ireland, Peter Sutherland, a genius, I don't know, if some of you met sometime, the founder of the World Trade Organization. He was the founder of Erasmus, this incredible European program that you know exchanges students from one country to another for a few months. And one day, having breakfast with Peter, I asked how this idea came out. And he said, Carlos, the problem was not that. The problem is that I wanted to implement this idea deeper. I wanted taxi drivers and butchers and carpenters and plumbers <laughs> to spend six months of their lives in a different country. But we couldn't because of whatever reason, basically money. So maybe LA with this idea of Maya could expand and increase the Maya program and to start exchanging also artists, creators, designers, architects, people that could spend six months in a different country, maybe when they are students attending college of higher education, and we could start through this leading world city, putting this kind of very innovative ideas as Maya is. I think Los Angeles has the capacity, the ideas, and the drive to, to lead this kind of initiatives. Thank you. And to your point, Zeb, you know, that it is absolutely our primary responsibility to take care of Angelinos, and even my job is all about what we can bring to Angelinos yeah. from, you yeah. know, from and vice versa, yes. Um, so, uh, in the meeting a couple of weeks ago that you and I were in, Carlos, with our with our bosses, our respective bosses, <laughs> um, 
the idea of a North American identity came up. And so I'm interested um, in hearing both of your thoughts on whether that exists, whether it should exist, how we can make it exist. Um, and it was in the context of the rise of China and that um, economically, the, the, the degree to which we can integrate more um, in North America could help us with um, the economic might to, um, to compete uh, effectively. But it goes beyond that as well. So why don't I start with you, Carlos, and then say. Well, I don't know, you can see, and we didn't speak this morning, so <laughs> both are wearing proudly the same pin, the three flags. Uh, well, I'm Mexican, I was born in, in Guadalajara, the second largest city of my country, but uh, my very first posting was Canada, Quebec. Uh, I have been privileged to visit the 10 Canadian provinces, I have been posted twice in the USA in this incredible country, Dallas, Texas, and Los Angeles, California. I have visited 42 of the 50, of the 50 states of the Union, and of course, the 32 states of the Mexican Union. So I feel I consider myself a proud North American. Uh, if you see to the, 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 the European case, how diverse and complex continent it is, at the end, they made it. They have a regional European identity. And I have to say, we North Americans, we don't have, I guess, a North American identity. And I think we have to build it as a matter of necessity. If you see this global and very competitive world, North America has to be a region, and not just for trade and industries, but for life. We need to be much more competitive towards the other regions of the world. So a necessity, yes. A possibility, yes. Very challenging, though. But we need to start teaching like, uh, in the schools the North American vision, the North American history, the North American geography, the North American demographics, but we need to start doing this. It's a necessity, and I guess urgent necessity, to build up a North American identity. Agreed. Uh, uh, yeah, I was going to mention the pin as well, so <laughs> there you go. Uh, we're already united there. Uh, so I'll give a quick personal kind of thing and then and, and talk, I think, a little more ex expansively, if you'll let me. Um, I'm <laughs> In my own family, while I've actually never uh, had the good fortune of, of visiting uh, or, or staying in, in Mexico. Not yet. Not yet, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, in my own family, we've got a very diverse family, um, and I happen, to be of, uh, I happen to be Muslim as well. And uh, one of our latest additions through, through marriages and all that in, our, in, in the second generation of which I'm a part of the fam uh, family, you know, people coming over from India and Pakistan, uh, into the U.S. and Canada as immigrants, and the kids, the cousins, if you will. Um, we just welcomed uh, recently a, a Mexican-Canadian uh, Muslim into our family, <laughs> which was such a cool thing for us to be able to say, um, frankly. Um, you know, we we've now have people who are of uh, Afro-Carib descent in our family. Uh, we have indigenous um, people who are in our family, uh, in my personal family, and, and now a, a Mexican Muslim Canadian. So just that idea to me when you know, I was like, what is, I don't even know who that, what is that? <laughs> so that's pretty cool. And for, for my personal point of view, the identity of what North America has meant has always included us, the three of us, I, I'll tell you. Now on a, on a more national perspective, of course the Canada and US Canadians are always surprised when some Americans don't quite understand how integrated Canada and the U.S. are through culture. People say, oh, do you get that TV show? Well, actually, we watch the same networks. We get CBS, NBC, ABC. We watch the same shows. We, in fact, create some of the same shows. A lot of the uh, entertainment and media and music that come out of uh, this part of the world uh, happen to either be originating from or working with uh, Canadians. And so that is a key component of the 
global North American output of media and content, Canada is throughout that in some way, shape, or form, whether it's through talent or behind the scenes or, or what have you. Um, then uh, about 90% of Canadians actually live very close to the border. Um, that is a, that, that's a key thing for us in, in terms of the US. Um, and then to sort of bring it back personally again, when this appointment, because I'm a political appointee, not part of, uh, as Jerry mentioned, not part of the, the diplomatic core, that's not my, it hasn't been my life uh, until now, um, this role, this position, Los Angeles, the connectivity to Mexico, the idea that I would get to be uh, embraced by and get more exposure to and get to share a culture uh, with uh, Mexican Americans and Mexicans and, and Angelinos, uh, the idea of Los Angeles and its Spanish heritage and its Latin American heritage and its Canadian uh, connectivity, that really, that was one of the reasons that I said yes to it, to be honest, because it's a very odd, potentially an odd choice. Sometimes it's odd to me that I made that choice. But what I'm reminded of is that it's, it's this connectivity, and it's this kind of kind of loving that we're even having now that made me say yes to this. Nice. All right, I'm gonna open it up in just a second, but let me ask you guys one more question. So think of your questions. Um, so subnational diplomacy, at least from my point of view, because now I am a subnational diplomat, uh, is, is on the rise. Um, I'm not the only one who says that. Um, and all the people in this room have a potential part to play in that. And I'm curious what advice you would give them about uh, how to play a role, uh, in particular with, with Mexico or Canada, but even more generally. Want to start, Zayden? Um. Look, it's, it's very, the idea of the, the global community and, and, and where, if you will, kind of city-states are going um, and, and what they can do for the world, as we even saw through the, through the video, and, and urbanization, that's, that's, a, that's, a key, that's a key factor in all of this, where we're headed uh, as a global consciousness. Cities can be of great value. States can be of great value uh, beyond just the nation. Um, we're seeing people come together. Uh, on a political level, the provinces and, and LA um, have, a, have a great relationship, whether it's through cap and trade programs with Quebec, Nova Scotia, BC, um, or whether it's um, mayor to mayors uh, leading the charge as it relates to provinces and states, Mexican, Canadian, and uh, American, um, and helping the global conversation alive through their work together and how they affect the, the governments of the states that they're in and of the countries that they're in. That's key. They can affect real change in a way that maybe we, we couldn't and before, right? Um, and I think that's one of the keys that we have to, to think about now is how do we take that next step because it's already so important from a subnational level. And again, as I said, my personal choice, LA meant something to me. It wasn't the fact that it was gonna be a Canada in, in the United States and working with Mexico. It was gonna be that a Canadian was gonna to get to work with Los Angeles uh, and the territory. So I think that's absolutely important, necessary, and in fact, it's probably gonna help shape what countries do. Because sometimes, as we're seeing in the political discourse of, of nations and continents, in fact, things are getting more divisive right now. It seems that way, there's a pressure. What, who's bringing those, that things together? It's actually the relationships that happen on a subnational level. That's what's keeping things together and whole. And I think that's gonna be very important in the next five to 10 years. And, and maybe, just, maybe, maybe we've, we've seen a shift and that's just the way it's always gonna be. But it seems right now, as we live in some turbulent times uh, um, uh, in our consciousness, but global times, it takes the subnationals globally to keep us connected nationally. Well, typically, people are more connected than governments, and typically, people uh, move faster than governments do. And I think it's, it's the case in general but specifically in, in our region. I mean, you see, again, the amount of Mexicans living in the US, not just in California, and the Americans living in Mexico everywhere, not just 
in Mexico City or Rosarito or, or Baja, everywhere. Uh, but still, you don't see that continuous, strong, frequent dialogue between states and cities where the real the power of the people run. So if you see the, the association of governors in the US, I suppose, I don't know, if that, but I, I'm sure <laughs> you know. there is a kind of <laughs> association, similar association in, 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 in Canada and the association of Mexican governors. As far as I know, we have not ever had a summit of governors of the three countries. We oh, have no. had the frequent summits of the presidents, but mm -hmm. not governors. Never in history mm -hmm. of North America. For me, that's a good thing to do thinking about sub diplomacy. And of course, cities. Cities have their own uh, dynamics, and there are everywhere twinning uh, sister cities, but sometimes our general twinnings, for me, a good thing to explore is to target cities, speaking about the specific topics. Digital cities, for instance, there are big opportunities twinning cities for digital purposes, benchmarking, best practices in digital things. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I have to say I'm happy because you, you know, Nina, very soon, in a month from now, Mexico is hosting the summit of mayors of North America in Los Cabos, Baja California Sur, and we will have roughly 200 mayors from the three countries. I think those are the, the real things we need to move faster. The integration of states and cities, city to city, state to city, state. That's the true sub-diplomacy that we need. Nice. Okay, questions from our audience, Sunny. Microphone? Anyone bring you one? I think you should just. Okay. Oh, wait, here it comes. Carlos, I have a very difficult uh, question for you, and I apologize in advance. But Let's see. as you know, uh, we have had a war on drugs for 50 years, uh, longest ever, and there is no end in sight. We lose 50 to 75,000 people on opiate addiction. Your country probably loses four or five times as many. Uh, the consequence on future generation, on infrastructure, infrastructure on, it's just uh, immense. And it seems like there is no solution other than both countries legalizing drugs. I mean, did Denver thing pass, by the way, mushroom? Did anybody know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so Denver just passed legalization of yes, mushrooms with LSD in it. So is there any, do you see any hope there, any political world, any or anything can be done about this phenomena? Thank you. Well, thank you for asking, and believe me, it's not the first time that I have this question. Uh, it's, it's true, it's a difficult, very difficult and tragic situation that we are passing through since several years. Uh, there are many reasons behind this problem, from corruption, Local police typically are very corrupt and, and are part of the gangs. President López Obrador is putting a lot of attention of creating for the first time a true national police that is part of the problem because in Mexico, you know, we have 2,572 municipalities, each of them with their own police, poorly paid, so you cannot fight such a big problem with this kind of organization. We need to create not a new army, not a new navy, but a true professional, very well paid and equipped national police. Working on that seriously for the first time in years. Uh, of course, we need much to pay much more attention to 
the, the intelligence of these kind of wars is not just weapons. We need a lot of intelligence fighting money laundering and many things like that, that we need to work harder and faster. But also, I think it's time to start thinking globally of a different kind of policies related to drugs. To fight drug consumption and trafficking has not been enough and up to now has not been the true answer and solution to this big problem. But also, we need to understand that this is an international problem. When you see, in the case of the US, so sad also to see that last year there were 72,000 people dying from overdoses in, in the US. Just the city of Philadelphia, eight persons per day die in the city of Philadelphia. So it's not just Mexico. The U.S. is also passing through a very tragic, tragic situation. There are more dead people in the U.S. than in Mexico because of this problem. So we both need to understand that we have to fight jointly this war. It's not a Mexican war, an American war. It's an international war, and we need to start working more and more Decriminalizing drugs, I guess, is the time to start thinking seriously of, of this and to fight jointly these kind of wars. Unless we understand this, I think we will keep suffering a lot, the three, well, in this case, the US and Mexico. Other questions? Right there. <clears throat> Microphone that's happening right here. Hi, uh, this is something that I also struggle with as I have conversations with other people because I too am an immigrant and I see the benefit of having sort of uh, global travel. But there are those who are getting caught up in this nationalistic movement because they're affected by many things in their local communities and they're receiving, whether good or bad advice, that there are certain groups of people to be blamed. And as you try to have conversations with them, the topic seems to go away from the issues and more towards you are closed-minded or, or persecuting the train of thought versus looking at the issues that don't just affect them but affect all of us. So I know you asked a question about how we can affect you know, soft diplomacy in that sense. What is some advice that you would give us, especially in this region of the world where we don't travel as freely? How do we combat that national, nationalistic tendency and make it a more constructive conversation versus an accusatory conversation? Good question. Um, thank you for that. <laughs> that's a, that's a, you're right, that's a, that's a deep, problem. I think it's a problem or a challenge, uh, an issue that's uh, slowly, Canada's not known for that, um, uh, but it is, you know, it's creeping in that, in that way um, because um, we are uh, so connected on an identity level um, with our two friends, neighbors, and ally countries. So as that flow happens, as that discourse evolves and gains momentum, uh, it, it crosses borders. And I think ultimately we have to remember that if that can cross borders, then so can all the positive discourse. And the idea that in fact, um, as Carlos was speaking, of, of the unity between the flow of uh, Mexico and Los Angeles and uh, Mexicans in uh, Los Angeles and Californians and Angelinos in Mexico, um, this idea of, of tra traveling and seeing diverse people, diverse thought processes, diverse ideas, voices, colors, genders. Um, we have a real opportunity here in North America, actually. North America is a hub, if you will, where generally, it's, you got a better shot at being who you want to be and who you are, looking at the mirror and looking around at people and saying, this is who I am, will you accept me? 
and them saying yes than maybe you do even anywhere else in the world. But we right now have to get it together and understand first that it might actually start with us. The more we can travel in each other's lands, the more we can identify with each other regardless of our differences, but in fact find the similarities um, and appreciate the differences, celebrate the differences, that's where the discourse can go. And just as the, the negative discourse is affecting us so, so massively, if you will, right now, so can the positive. We just have to flip that switch. And it's possible because the other switch was possible. And where there's one switch, there's always another. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, I have to first thank Jerry for the kind words, wherever Jerry is, and Sony for having us here today. Um, my question is a bit of an instigation and a question, which is I really appreciate this concept of the North American unity. Um, I think that uh, is something that should be grown and, and should, we should resonate that. Um, and yet, how are we going to share what is maybe an opportunity, what is maybe an investment, but what is also maybe a cost, um, and derive, in a sense, a continental leadership with respect to the planetary boundaries, if that's a concept that has come up in your discussions, uh, the UN SDGs and, and green strategies, to use a sort of belated term. I'm really interested in hearing how maybe collectively that could be um, a way to create this continental continuity and agreement, um, knowing full well that it will cost something in the beginning, but that in long term it actually may in effect create a North American unity um, and maybe it could be you know, through small programs like Maya, Green Ambassadors, as well as larger programs that you guys would bring to the table. Well, as, as said before, I'm fully convinced that we have a shared challenge uh, in creating a true, real human North American identity. It's, and I said, it's a necessity, an urgent necessity. How to proceed, for me, this, the right point to start with is with the people. Uh, we travel a lot. Mexicans go travel a lot to the US. Americans travel a lot to Mexico. Mexicans go to Canada. Canadians go to Mexico. The people started doing their own homework, but it has been, not been enough and again, our governments have not really heavily involved in this integration among the people. And I think they could do more, and not just federal national governments, but state and city governments. For me, I think that we need to use more and more as schooling, teaching North America, but also language, I think, it would be a good idea if more Mexicans learn much better and faster English and French. I think it would be a great idea for the American people to learn more foreign languages in, in general, but specifically Spanish. It's incredible because you meet lots of Americans that have some Spanish, but then they stop improving their Spanish because all, many Americans go to high school and take Spanish, but then they stop. It's interesting to analyze this because they don't go further and it's not just the American people, it's in general all the English speaking people as the main by far language spoken in the world. But would be a great idea to, 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 to be more effective and efficient teaching foreign languages at schools and especially elementary education uh, sports is something that uh, is natural. We exchange, we, well, we are not yet like the Canadians, part of the MLS or the FLA and the NBA and all these uh, sport, professional sports. I hope soon Mexican teams will be part of one, just one North American league of baseball and basketball and soccer and all the sports. The sport is a great way to connect people, we have to explore much more sports as a way to integrate more and more our communities. At the end of the day, the, the 
two uh, challenges to know much better and to trust much better each other. If you want to trust, you need much better the person you want to trust. Um, the, uh, Gavin, our, our, one of our lead consuls from our team, who many of you already probably know, uh, we were talking earlier, um, talking about the connectivity, um, talking about the monarch butterfly, where you know the, the, the scientists of all three nations really kind of said, wait a second, we're gonna work together to make sure this species, we get to discover it and what it does and how we, and we're gonna work together to, to help something and how its life cycle goes and where its travel cycle goes and what that species, what it's experiencing, what can we learn from that? And for some reason, when you asked that question, that conversation popped into my mind that somehow, um, that unity that those scientists showed by learning from uh, nature, in fact, learning how nature crosses borders and is planetary and interplanetary, how do we learn from that? And then the thing that I think that our, our federal government at least is doing, and I, I so agree with you, Carlos, that it's people to people really matter, but I'm proud to say that in this uh, incarnation of our heads of mission, as we're called, or consul generals, on the US network at any rate, and especially in this territory as it relates to Mexico uh, and, and even uh, the other southern states where the Canadians are, are uh, stationed or posted, um, we're all broken out into to working groups and, and heads of working groups, um, energy and environment, national defense and security, um, trade, partnerships, alliances, these are the words we use when we go back to Ottawa or Washington and our breakout sessions and who's on that. And I, I happen to be on the National Defense and Security and the Energy and Environment Working Groups. And the ambassador personally said to me, you know, one of the things that I'm hoping that you'll help uh, achieve with the mission staff is to increase our connectivity to uh, our, our Mexican and our LATAM businesses, politicians, and um, uh, innovation and, and fact experts scientists, academics. And so I think that's, it does sometimes take a, a government to do that. I was inspired, again, as a person who's really new to this system, I was inspired that the ambassador was asking me to do that and I was part of this and that I get to say that I'm on a working group of this, of this caliber. And I th I'm hoping that that kind of discourse and that kind of feeling that we can bring that to the table in our personal, interpersonal, people-to-people -people relationships. Anyway, those are the two things that sprung to mind when you asked that. Yeah. Briefly, because you spoke about the monarch butterfly, that is a beautiful example of North America. Well, next time you pass through the Mexican consulate in front of MacArthur Park, I hope you can see the mural that Major Garcetti unveiled a month and a half ago with the monarch butterflies. Because we want to be seen also a, as a symbol of North America in LA, the Mexican consulate. So I hope you can go and see this beautiful mural. Very Instagrammable, I might say. Very nice. But I wanted to also say just a couple of points, which is that um, Mayor Garcetti met Mayor Scheinbaum, and she's a climate scientist. She's the mayor of Mexico City, or now head of government of Mexico City. Um, and so we've talked about um, collaborations. He's also running to be the chair, the mayor is, our mayor is, of the C40, which is a global uh, network of mega polluting cities. Um, and we've just announced last week our new Green Deal, which I recommend to you all. It's pretty ambitious um, and pretty well thought out as well. It's on, a, it's on the website. Um, we're also one of few cities measuring our progress toward the sustainable development goals. Um, so we're going to actually go to the UN and submit to a, what's called a voluntary local review uh, coming up this year. So, um, and always happy to share that work with any of our um, Mexican and Canadian brothers and sisters cities. Um, also, Governor Newsom, I know, has a particular interest in working on the Tijuana River. And so I, I, I agree with you that sometimes, you know, planetary doom can focus the mind um, and maybe get us to cooperate more together. Other questions? Time for a couple more. Yes, right there. What? Where are they? <laughs> I can't see anything. Okay, this guy and then you. 
Hi, good afternoon, thanks for joining us. I wanted to ask a question focusing on a concept that the deputy, uh, deputy mayor mentioned, which is that of subnational diplomacy. Uh, at times, maybe particularly right now, some national trade policies don't always necessarily protect local commercial or business interests. So from a diplomatic angle, how do you go about thinking about striking that balance between pursuing national directives and protecting local interests when they're not always in alignment? I didn't get the first question. I think if, I'm, if, I'm, if I heard you correctly, the, the question is, how do you strike the balance between a national directive and local interests when they don't always line up? And the example given was trade policies. Is that right? I think from, from the Canadian perspective, in fact, the true positivity is in alignment. I mean, that's, that's the goal, um, that where the where the, the local or the, or the, or the self-interest, there's a great reliance on that. Canadians have been incredibly um, aware of that. We're, the, one of the, we're arguably the largest country in the world with the smallest population. I don't even know if it's arguably, it could be a fact, but this, there's more fact uh, checkers in this room than me, so I'm just gonna shoot it off my mouth and say that. But it feels that way when you're a Canadian. When you have to travel the country, there's so little people, there's so much. And so you understand, and as an Im immigrant son, as I said, you know, I come from a city where 50% um, of the population is born outside the country and there's over 140 languages spoken. And I know that uh, the deputy mayor and mayor would talk about what Los Angeles stats are on, on that. And that's why I feel very aligned on that. And so for us, the idea of alignment is this first and perhaps the essential step to true unity. Um, and we want to align, we think there is alignment out of local interest when it comes to inclusivity, when it comes to a feminist foreign policy, when it comes to um, climate change awareness. Um, those very much are uh, of local value, but we think are uh, a value that can be brought in. Now, there are challenges sometimes depending on, on who uh, is leading um, your government or your nation or your city or your state or your local council or even your probably school council or school council, right? Politics change with the people that inhabit them sometimes if the system isn't sound. And sometimes where systems are unsound, we are finding in, in Canada there are challenges to the trade policy specifically, obviously, as it relates to tariffs that have been placed through the Section 232 on, on steel and aluminum, frankly. Um, we're having a, a big conversation about that. I don't know that I want to get into that here. I have other rooms that I have to give speeches and, and, and big statements about that. But we're going to have to address that. Um, and the local interest is getting in the way of true unity. And it's probably not going to help unity. Um, but if we can get it together, I think, uh, from a Canadian American and a Mexican perspective, and I'm just speaking that way from a map perspective, not trying to uh, sort of you know, uh, rank any, any country or anything like that. Um, that. That identity is whole as the trade policy is successful, as the employment and job growth and the services that bounce back and forth between those borders and the regulation but openness of the borders and, and the bridging of those borders that the value to that is exponential. And then we'll be, as Carlos was saying, when that identity is whole, when those alignments are more aligned than not, then the continent is gonna be a global power, I think, in the way that you think of Europe his historically. When you think of the Enlightenment, and you think of where Europe took the world, well, North America has a, a, can step right now in the next five to 20 years and really lead the, the next enlightenment, the next renaissance, the next whatever that ethos is gonna be. It could come from here, but alignment is key, um, and we're not there yet. Well, I excuse myself if I don't reply properly your, your whole question, but you spoke at the end of your comments about the, the specific topic of trade. We have not spoken so much up to now about trade because, as you know, we are in the <laughs> difficult time of trying to ratify the USMCA or TMEC, as we call it in Mexico, and a few days ago I was part of a different panel and I said, well, that's the first challenge we have 
let's try to find out a, a common name for the three countries of the new trade uh, agreement. We have not found yet a, a common name, but I think. Well, the new because, NAFTA. Because still is NAFTA <laughs> running. I mean, it's still valid, and that's my concern. <laughs> because I have heard some comments saying, well, at the end of the day, if the USMCA is not ratified, what's the problem? We still have NAFTA. I'm not so sure that is the right position we need to take. Because for me, in every negotiation, you lose and you win. In any negotiation. For Mexico, this new agreement implies some sacrifices, but in some regards, it's much better. But at the end, this new deal is wider and deeper for the three countries. It means a much more integrated North America, economically speaking. So we need to fight to be ratify the new deal, not NAFTA, because the new one is a much better deal among the three countries. So we have to be careful to say, with NAFTA, we are okay. No, let's keep moving forward for a much deeper and wider North America. There's one question here, and then that's probably, you're probably the last question. We have just a, about a minute. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to ask, um, I'm definitely inspired by the vision of sort of the North American vision. And, and I think, I mean, in the experience that I've had in my career in working some of these issues, I mean, out of the tragedy of the 9-11 attacks, I think one of the silver linings that came out of 9-11 in some ways was the deepening integration in North America at our borders, in our, how we think about our, the security of the perimeter of North America in our, the integration of our economies. But here's a challenge that I think North America, one of the many challenges that North America faces in terms of how we define North America, and specifically in looking at what can the three countries of North America, as we've defined it, uh, do to address the conditions in the Northern Triangle of Central America that are driving so many hundreds of thousands of people north, and also how do we work together as three countries together to manage those migratory flows of some asylum seekers and other migrants? Well, that's a great question that we could spend an entire session on, but I'm going to ask you to keep both of your answers pretty short. Well, I think that now the real challenge is to stop people moving from south north. And this is our region, because keep in mind that nowadays, worldwide, 65% of the world migration is from a south country to another south country, from a poor country to another poor country. It's not true that most of the migration goes south north of poor rich. No, it's not, it's not the truth. But in our region, it's of course a problem. And I think we need the three countries to invest jointly, strongly in those three countries. If we want to stop that permanent flow and growing flow of migrants, we need the three together go, going and to, and to invest. It's the structural funds of the European Union. How the Europeans were able to stop migration from southern countries to northern countries, they created the structural funds. The new NAFTA, or whatever we, <laughs> we call it, has not something like that. A structural funds to invest in the poorer parts of our three countries and the Triangle of the North. We should one day to, to include that specific chapter, structural funds. Uh, thank you, Carlos. I mean, he's, he's been very wise on the subject. But I, I'd say that um, whatever it means to us, better policy, better regulation, and better investment, those are really the key things from my standpoint. Well, this has been terrific. Um, before we end, I just want to say to you all, you are Global LA. You are all agents of this, of subnational diplomacy. And uh, we are always in the mayor's office open to ideas. Bear with us in terms of scheduling and stuff because, uh, you know, sometimes we, we have a lot on our plates. But I'm really very open to hearing any of your ideas um, on how we can, um, be, you know, help with the North American identity um, or beyond. But I want to thank our two fantastic Consul General. Well done. Thank you.